It sounds like some people were curious about how I approach doing one mic recordings where I have, you know, a duo or a small group all doing a live take in one room around one mic. I want to do my best not to turn this into a boring talking head segment. I'm going to show you some specific things that I did in terms of placement and mixing that I think a lot of people will find helpful. But I think a big part of this is kind of a mindset thing. So I do want to talk about that a little bit because the session that I had last week was a good example to talk about because when they came in the first day, it was a duo, um, had a woman singing and playing acoustic guitar and then a guy playing banjo. They told me beforehand that they didn't want to record live together in the room. They wanted to split things up and do separate takes on everything and do overdubs. And so the first important thing here to recognize is that these two people are not professional musicians. And I don't mean that as a slight, but this is a mindset thing. They're coming in here to do, do this for fun. They just wanted to do a few songs. They're married. Um, they've played a lot over the years and they just wanted to do a couple of songs for fun. So mindset wise, that's a, that's a good starting point because when people tell me that I want to make sure that they enjoy their time in here and that I'm not too hard on them because when you have people coming in that do this for a living, there's certain expectations and most of the time they're expecting me to tell them when things are good and bad and to push them a little bit so they get their best takes. That's not the case here in this specific situation. So my biggest thing going into this session was to make sure that they were comfortable and that they were getting the best takes that they could, but not pushing them too hard and driving them nuts. So we came in the first day. I I heard them play a couple of the songs live together and they played really, really well together. Um, I could tell they've been playing together for years. Um, it showed. So we started splitting stuff up. I set up metronomes and stuff in their headphones, got them in here. I could tell it was a little bit of a struggle for them because a lot of this have done this forever. We forget how unnatural it is for someone to cram headphones on us and give us a click track and say, play monkey. I mean, you get good at it over the years, the more you do it, but it it's a really unnatural thing and it throws a lot of people off. And I could tell that that just was not floating their boat and they're struggling a little bit because they've never done this before. So they got two songs done and they're really good, but a couple of them just weren't working out. And so at the end of the first day, I said, hey, when you come in tomorrow, I'd like to try to track you together. And they're, I think they're a little bit hesitant, but I was like, let's just try it and see how it goes. So they came in the second day. I got them around this one mic. This is my old 1932 RCA PB90. So it's a ribbon microphone, picks up from the front and the back, and you've got knolls on the sides. Came in, had her sitting where I was playing acoustic guitar and singing. He was sitting in behind the mic playing banjo. I had him record like a minute of a song and come back in and listen. They're like, this sounds great. We love this. Awesome. So mindset wise, again, a lot of times this is not going to work out well. Uh, it really... It, it relies heavily on the group of people being able to play well together and controlling their dynamic. And these people have been playing together for most of their lives, and you could tell. They just played so much better together in the room. So I would just encourage everyone to think about the mindsets involved on doing something like this because it's not something you're going to be able to do all the time. But when it works out, it is a glorious, magical thing. Um, it's funny when I when I multi-track stuff out, it drives me nuts if like I put one mic on an acoustic guitar and then we overdub vocals. If I have to pan both of those things down the middle and try to mix them like that, it always sounds horrible to me, drives me nuts. It sounds like things are fighting with each other. If I know I'm going to have to do something like that, I always track the acoustic guitar or whatever in stereo just to give things a little bit more spread on the instrument so the vocal's not fighting down the middle. Again, I don't know what it is that bugs me so much trying to do two mono sources in the middle like that when it's a vocal and an acoustic instrument. Lots of people do it and it sounds great. But anyway, 
it's really funny when you have multiple sources coming in on one mic, like I did with these two, it's never bothered me. It always sounds natural. And honestly, I can't tell you why that is. I have theories. I think most of it is probably just that live performance aspect. And it just feels more realistic and believable because it's two people playing off each other in a room. So I think part of it's performance. Um, I think part of it too is just the room because I mean, you can obviously do this with any mic, but I only do this with ribbons these days. It's the only thing I do when I'm trying to do something like this. Um, I think part of it is when you have ribbons in figure eight, you pick up more of the room. Um, things are more phase aligned. It's a lot of factors, but again, all that to say, it's just, it's interesting to me that doing it this way doesn't bother me as much as trying to multi-track stuff out and pan like a guitar and vocal down the middle. But, um, okay. I probably rambled enough. Let me, we'll jump camera angles and I'll kind of talk about why I did some things the way I did placement wise. And we'll go from there. This is definitely not the prettiest camera angle. <laughs> it's much more important that you can kind of see everything as we talk through this. Um, so my first pro tip that I've learned over the years is make sure that you're not screwing with the artist's line of sight between each other. This is a specific instance where it's a duo. So all of this is going, going to be a little bit more specific to this scenario, this specific session. So it was a duo singing and playing guitar here, banjo singing on the other side. So a lot of times it's very important that the two people be able to look at each other and get visual cues when they're playing with each other. Do not screw with that. Mindset wise, I I would suggest that it is, it is always more important to sacrifice mic position if it means you're going to get a better take from the player. The take always trumps the audio side of things. I will bend over backwards to do things differently in terms of mic placement or whatever if it means facilitating a better take out of the players. The take is the most important thing. So one thing I've learned over the years is that in an ideal world, I like putting the ribbon mic on my big latch leg stand and starting with it high, kind of like this, and working my way down, setting up like this as a starting point has always worked out better for me. So I get in the habit of doing it this way if I can. The problem with doing it this way is that this mic is right in their line of sight. So right when they sat down and started playing, the first thing I did was I just picked up the mic. It wasn't even on the stand. I picked up the mic and I walked over and put it in front of her head and said, hey, is this going to be okay if the mic's here? And they looked at each other and they're like, yeah, that's fine. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Good starting point. I've had a lot of times where I do that and people say, no, nah, man, that's not going to work. So if that's the case, have a smaller stand on standby, a small floor stand so that you can put the mic on the floor stand and it's sitting right here. That's usually not ideal sound wise in my experience. But again, the take always trumps the technology. Ooh, that came off the tongue. Well, take trumps technology. You can patent that. Um, in this case, this worked out well. They were fine with that. Cool. So moving on, set up like this, got it set up. Um, pro tip number two, I have found the majority of the time um, the singer is always quieter than their guitar or instrument. And so generally you end up placing the mic a little bit closer to their vocal than you do the guitar or whatever instrument they're playing. So should probably back up a little bit though. I would say the next thing you need to think of is just listen to them playing in the room and decide what the most important instrument um, in their arrangement is. In this case, and this is true most of the time, it's usually the voice. The voice is going to be the most important thing. It doesn't matter how good you get the instrument sounding if you can't hear what they're singing. Um, most people want to hear the voice much louder than the instruments. And because you're one miking, you get what you get. You can't turn the vocal up afterwards. So Generally, what I do is I start out with the mic in the most ideal position to get what I'm hearing as the best vocal take. And so I got her vocal sounding pretty good right about here, and the mic was probably starting out like that. That was the best take. That sounded good on her vocal. 
So then when I got the mic situated vocal wise, I started listening to the instruments and I probably had him stop playing at that point because I wanted to hear the acoustic guitar because again, the most difficult thing is going to be getting the mix between the vocal and the acoustic guitar. I mean, you could have her here and actually show you. I mean, if you absolutely have to, you can have the player angle their guitar down if they're okay with that. But um, generally speaking, these are two immovable objects. The voice and the guitar can't really move. They are where they are. So you're going to have to work around those two things. So she was singing fairly quiet and so I kind of worked my way up and down to get a good balance and then started angling too. The other thing I'd say is it's important to always have a pop filter on standby. Even if you don't think you need the pop filter, I, I would say just throw it up there anyway because that can ruin an amazing take. The last thing you want to do is them getting into the take and they lean in and blow into the mic and ruin the take. So... I would just suggest always putting a pop filter on at the very end of the process just to cover your butt. So angle-wise, and that's probably frying your ears, sorry. Angle-wise, you know, I ended up with the mic about mouth level with her. I probably angled it back a little bit to deal with plosives and air better just to, again, cover myself. And probably at that point, the guitar was probably still just a little quiet, so I ended up you know, angling it just a little bit to try to balance the level between vocal and guitar. So at that point, you've dealt with your two immovable objects and you've gotten your mix between those. Um, for banjo, I can move him around. So I can either tell him, hey, you need to play a little quieter or a little softer, or I can just move him forward and backwards. Um, the other reason, and I knew this in Foresight, the other reason I angled this back a little bit is because banjos are really freaking loud. It's like the loudest instrument out there. You literally, if you look at how guitar designers started shifting their designs of acoustic guitars in the 30s and started making dreadnoughts and bigger bodies, they're literally doing that to fight banjos. <laughs> anyway, getting off track. Banjos are loud. So another reason I angled this back is because figure eights have a null Everyone remembers, you know, figure eight has a null on the side, but remember it has a null on the top and bottom as well. So I knew I was probably going to be fighting the banjo a little bit. So instinctively, I kind of angled it back so that that null was pointing towards where the where the banjo was going to be. And so had them set up and you know funny enough this ended up not being a big deal i thought i was gonna have to fight with the banjo a little bit and their dynamic and playing level ended up being really good so i fiddled with his placement moving him front and back a little bit um probably another mindset thing that's important is that again the take and them being comfortable and playing well always takes precedent over everything else um some people, if I'm listening to them and I'm getting really nitpicky towards the end of the process of placing things, I'll say, hey, do you think you could play just a little quieter or, you know, a little louder? Um, I won't do that unless I absolutely have to. If it's people I know that I've worked with a lot and they're pros and I know they can do that, I'll tell them that. But um, don't get too picky on, you know, telling people what to try to do and not do you don't want to get in their heads and ruin the potential for a good take so he ended up being really good just level wise and they synced really well we recorded a take at that point went back in the control room and he was like yeah i think i need to play louder in the solo or something he heard that and he said i can do that and so um this ended up being a pretty easy straightforward um, session. It took about 15 minutes to place the mic and get them playing and we ran through songs and it was great. So yeah, it's probably a good overview on placement stuff. Sorry I don't have people in the room. That would have been ideal, but I I very rarely mix these videos with like my professional life. I try to keep them separate. I don't like doing stuff like this when people are paying for studio time. But anyway, um, that covers placement stuff pretty well. Um, I'm gonna, we'll jump over to my computer and I'll show you 
two really cool things that I did that I think will help a lot. But um, I don't want to get too heavy into mixed stuff because every situation is different. Even with this, every performance, every room, every mic, everything's different. So, I mean, those are some kind of just rough tips on how I approach this really specific situation. I'm going to show you two things that I did mix-wise that I think will help out a lot as well. All right, never mind. I changed my mind. <laughs> I was going to jump to the control room and show you this on the computer, but this stuff's really straightforward. I'm just going to tell you what I did, and I'll play some A-B examples so you can hear it, because that's the most important thing. So when you do one mic things with a mono mic, you're obviously mono. I think it has the potential to sound more natural that way. Everything's perfectly in phase. There's tons of things to like about mono. The problem with that, though, is especially when people are on, are on headphones, mono sounds very, very unnatural. You get this really weird kind of fake center that seems like it's coming from the middle of your head as opposed to you hearing people in front of you. And the really easy way to do that is just to, you know, make it stereo a little bit. I'll be very honest. I have experimented with just doing some close room mics to supplement a mono mic when you're doing this one mic stuff. Um, it's worked out fine, but funny enough, the thing that has worked the best is the Universal Audio Ocean Way Studio plugin. They have kind of done a digital version of the Ocean Way Studio, and I don't know what it is about that plugin, but it's a really good room plugin. But on top of that, when you send it mono sources, it almost exaggerates the stereo image in some settings in a really cool way that I honestly I just haven't been able to recreate with real mics in a real room. And so again, I don't want it. I've tried to do this where there's room mics and you're trying to do it as an effect to make it sound big and roomy, you know. Feel free to do that. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't want to give it, give the impression that that's wrong. But what I want to do here is I just want I want mono plus. Think of this almost as MS, where you're just adding a little bit of width to a mono signal. I still want it to sound mono, but I don't want it to sound you know claustrophobic, where something's happening in the middle of your head. And you can this is really obvious in headphones, but you can still hear it in speakers. So I've just looked for ways over the years to add just a little width to that mono signal. Um, so Ocean Way is really good. Let me play that for you real quick. I'll just kind of bring that in and out so you can hear the difference. I might have talked that up a little too much. It, it's a subtle thing because, again, I don't want it. My thing here was that I didn't want it to actually sound like it's adding room tone or anything or making it super stereo. I just kind of want mono enhanced, kind of like MS <laughs> when you do an MS technique. But um, I think even in real life, when you're hearing one thing in a room and it's coming, you know, down the center when you're hearing it. Even when you do that, you know, the room comes in to the equation, things hit your ears differently. So, I mean, in real life, we're never really hearing things in true mono like you would through a pair of headphones or a pair of speakers, especially in headphones where it sounds like it's coming from inside your skull. That never happens in real life. So when you're trying to do this, I think it's important just to enhance it just a little bit so, you know, feels like 
you're actually looking at something as opposed to it coming from inside inside of your head. So another way you can do that besides doing a more natural room reverb thing is just a little bit of reverb or delay. You might be doing this kind of thing for nostalgic reasons where people want to sound like a Johnny Cash song, like Cry, Cry, Cry. Um, a lot of those songs, I used a little bit of a slapback or a little bit of reverb, so you might end up doing that anyway. Um, I also supplemented this recording with a little bit of Sound Toys Super Plate plate reverb. So let me play that for you back and forth. I'm going to take the room tone out as well a few times so you can just hear what the reverb's doing. To find my love alive or dead, John has gone for a soldier. So in the end, after I did a little bit of mixing, I just, you know, I had a little bit of that UAD Ocean Oceanway plug-in just to add a little bit of width, and then I also had that stereo super plate plate reverb. So now I'll just throw, I don't know, I'll do some pretty camera angles of the PB90, and I'll just play you the song that they did so you can hear it all in context. So, funny story, today's video is actually sponsored by Pulsar Modular. I realize I just made a huge video making fun of things just like this, but what makes this one a little bit different is that Pulsar Modular had reached out to me and said, hey, if you ever do any cool, interesting videos in the future, they're kind of like of educational content, we'd love to see you do more of those and would love to sponsor them. So, 
I'm very happy to work with companies like that. I'm also never going to take a sponsorship unless I'm actually using their products and stand behind them. So I've been in love with their P455 MD inside car that just came out earlier in the year. I use it a lot on my master bus and my drum bus. I've also enjoyed their P44 Magnum uh, transformer plug-in. Gives you a bunch of cool options for just color and saturation. So definitely take a look at those two and all their other cool plugins. Pulsar Modular, thank you very much. Hope to work more with you in the future.